So I uh, come from a family of refugees. All four of my grandparents migrated from Pakistan to India. I was the first granddaughter uh, for my maternal grandmother after three grandsons, and she was thrilled. So my nickname is Guria, and and like you know, back in India, everyone calls me Guria. No one calls me Akanksha at all. made you really uh, announce your candidacy in february this year it doesn't take too long to join the un to first of all realize there are two uns there's a un that makes decisions there's a un that implements decision the decision making bodies are flawed i won't deny it the security council has the limitations of veto power the general assembly decisions on voluntary ecosoc economic social commissions are voluntary that it really has no binding impact flawed implementation utter failure implementation is where for every dollar the un receives 30 cents is used for the cause when it comes to climate it's 15 cents to a dollar and this is an organization that has the best employees in the world that has adequate financial resources but the leadership is the problem and i'll share two examples of leadership uh, failures that i've experienced you know the first day of secretary general as part of protocol they give a speech to staff before they go to their office so the speech was supposed to start on January 2nd at 9.15 a.m. And like all employees, I was there at 9, uh, waiting to get a good spot. At 9.15, the Secretary General comes. There's the makeshift rectangle podium. He comes, he comes on that, uh, and behind him come a series of men, all in suits, who just stand like a horseshoe in front of the podium, literally cutting stuff. And, and that is when I was like, what? I don't remember anything the Secretary General said, but I remember the feeling of leadership just making staff feel belittled, like, you know, just cutting across them and standing there. And I asked my colleague and I was like, oh, my God, did you see that? She said, see what? And I was like, what they did? She said, oh, that's normal. And that's when it hit me. It was my first week at the UN that this is the leadership of the UN. You know, in any organization, success of an organization depends on how leaders treat the employees who are going to do the work. This is how our leadership treats us. Then in a few months, um, in, I went to Africa, to Uganda for a work trip. I saw a child eat mud. It was a devastating image for me, you know, to see a child eat mud when I was living in a hotel and I was able to afford everything I wanted to eat. All I could do for that little girl at that time was to give her some cash and food. When I came back to New York, I asked one of our senior officials, like, you know, why is that child eating mud? Why can't we do things differently? And he said, I quote, mud is good for children. It has iron. So this is a leadership that doesn't take care of the people it's supposed to serve. This is the level of apathy they have. They don't take care of the employees they're supposed to serve. This is the problem. So my decision to run is influenced by what I've learned about the workings of the UN and the leadership of the UN. And if we, as a generation, you know, millennials and Gen Zs, we will inherit this world. We are ready to shine our leadership skills and bring forth our new ideas in every arena, except in international organizations, we haven't been given a chance. So my decision to run is to bring that new perspective, bring that missing link into of, of a gender that hasn't been considered and of a generation that's ready and prepared to take the baton. Uh, Akansha, from what I understand, uh, your decision to run hasn't really gone down well with a lot of people. And uh, there are some of them who are calling it a premature decision. And, you know, one of the, the former members of the United Nations, Edward Mortimer, he said that you don't stand a chance. Where is this sort of perception coming from? And do you think that, you know, your lack of experience in diplomacy is coming in the way of, you know, you becoming uh, the next uh, secretary general? So your first part is, what did someone say about me? To be honest with you, um, I am not concerned on what anyone has to say about me but with that being said i am aware of the comment that you that you read and what's interesting is that comments like that have only been made by men with that being said i will answer your question on why i think i have the relevant experience for 75 years we have given the role of secretary general to one profile all men all older all in politics and diplomacy where are we today 
What results are we proud of? We have the highest number of refugees, displaced, and stateless people in the world. Climate, which is an existential crisis, we're no, nowhere close to solving it. We're just close to talking about it. If for every dollar, 15 cents is going to nature-based solution, I can tell you in 20 years from now, the question would not be who is the next secretary general. The question would be where are we going to live? We've had um, nine secretary general, all the same profile, and have just talked, talked, talked. Where are the results? We now need an action-oriented leader. We need someone who can deliver on the promises of all the decisions that member states invest in. And that's where my experience as an employee, my experience as a young person, my experience as an innovator comes in. So what do you think are the, the larger challenges facing the UN right now? So the first and foremost challenge is that in 21 years into the 21st century, we haven't seen technology and innovation being used at the UN in ways it's been used in every profession. Like, let's not forget journalists, like bloggers are today journalists. The technology has disrupted all professions and expanded the scope and made it better. In, humanity, in UN world, we still run on paper. We still run on processes that are not innovative. Like, I'll give you simple examples. Today, we have apps that allow translation from English to Arabic and vice versa, and yet we send translators to conflict zones, and we don't use technology, so all the money is not being used for the cause. When it comes to development, over the last 40 years, we have tried to use a regonomics model, give money to the top, hope it will trickle down, but all we need to do right now is to give internet and education to the people of the world, which are the tools for economic progress, which are the tools for freedom in 21st century. So what, what needs to happen is a new generation needs to come in with a new idea. So I'm proposing 25% of leadership positions to, get, to, be, to be given to the youth, which is under 35, to bring in youth through employment opportunities, to allow technology and innovation to seep into all our operations and, and revisit why we even exist. You know, there's, there's something that I've always been meaning to ask that for bigger crises and, you know, crises which have been, um, you know, uh, brewing over the years, the Israel-Palestine conflict, um, you know, the, the Myanmar conflict, um, yes. you know, while the UN has been involved, but I, you know, it, there's, it doesn't seem like there's much happening uh, in terms of mitigating the crisis. Now, where do you stand on this? Uh, you know, I'd like to know your views on that. When a conflict happens, UN's response is, to write a report and tweet about it. That is not the solution. And I'll take Myanmar as an example and then go into Israel and Palestine conflict. Uh, so let's start with Myanmar. A coup happened on February 1st. What did we do? We tweeted about it. We, we issued a report that calls to attention. And then we started escalating the language of the report from calls to condemns to all these other words. Did we ever pick up the phone and speak to them? Did we ever engage in a conversation? We did not engage in a conversation with Junta until the ASEAN conference a week and a half ago. What does UN do in conflicts? We send politicians to mediate. We do not even send psychologists or negotiators or trained personnel to diffuse the situation. And the conversation between politicians is like almost, hey, hey, you've killed enough. Let's stop right now. Or we'll like, you know, defer the case to ICJ. No, you really need to hire you need to have strong like psychologists on the team to understand the psychology of the person and give them a way out. That's what women know. Men always engage in ego. Women are like solution oriented. Okay, no ego. It doesn't matter who says what, who puts the first foot forward. Let's get the right thing done for the people. So that's my approach on Myanmar. Palestine and um, Israel conflict, 1948. This was, um, this has been brewing. I think you use the right word. This has been brewing for a while and we haven't addressed it and through adequate conversation because we all know it's a two-state solution. That is what's needed. How do you bring two sides together that don't trust each other? And that needs to be, we need different brokers. So the latest broker we had was the quartet. In 2016, that, quart, the la, that was the last time the quartet met. Quartet includes EU, Russia, US, and UN. They are the ones who were supposed to broker the deal. Under Trump administration, the quartet never met. The Secretary General should have initiated a conversation under, with the quartet in all of 2021 when we had a new administration. Why did we have to wait so late? And then this is how they retaliated. So we don't engage in conversations enough. Uh, Akansha, my final question to you. Um, India, as you know, is going through you know, a massive crisis. Um, we are recording a huge number of cases and deaths on a regular basis. 
and uh, you know it's it's seeing the worst covid-19 surge yet so how do you think the un can support india through this kind of a crisis well first of all my condolences to everyone who's going through the the crisis and the loss of loved ones or anyone they know i having personally lost my grandmother i know anything i say the words are not enough but with again my condolences my prayers and blessings for everyone i think we have to acknowledge that the world has stepped up in helping india at a national level from all the countries and un as well with that being said of course things should there's some things that have to be done differently and that is the patent has to be lifted i'm a patent was produced from publicly funded taxpayer dollars which means it's a public good if it's a public good it cannot have a patent or and that is something that needs to be lifted right away and united nations should be taking a lead in negotiating that to making sure that all countries because today it's in india the surge but other countries are also struggling with not having access to vaccines so i think that is one thing i would say that they need to invest and secondly any financial resource that can be redirected to india must be redirected